halfway through primary five, my aunt came into my classroom during a regular lunch break. She went in and took me out of class, and she withdrew my student status. And the next thing I know, within three days, I was boarded a one-way flight from Australia, from Hong Kong to Australia, just like that. And as you can see, it's not exactly a neighboring place. But fortunately, in fifth grade, my English ability was first place in class. It was reading, writing, and speaking. And when I say first place in class, I literally mean the last. There was absolutely no way I could breathe in an English environment, let alone make friends. So when I was first enrolled into the primary school, that was fully English. The teacher assigned me a buddy, a buddy that would talk to me, sit next to me in class from morning till afternoon and every break time, from recess to lunch and even to the bathroom. And I go to the bathroom quite often. You see, at a very early age, I was already occupied but available. The only way for me to make friends and fit in the, with the crowd was to play basketball, and I did. And I, what's even more convenient is that I lived literally two streets away from school. So this is one of the streets, and the next street, and I would reach home, literally within five minutes. And on that first street that I was walking home on a very casual afternoon, I was holding a basketball in my left arm. I was literally standing at the arrow right there. I was walking home and drove around the corner was a motorbike. It came around the corner, seated with two high school teenagers, perhaps some of you like that. They stared at me, I stared at them, and there was a magical moment. And at this magical moment, they decided to deliver a gift to me. They gave me the middle finger. And as a somewhat extroverted and social person, sociable person like myself, very gentleman-like, I decided to kindly re return the friendly gesture, but this time with speed and style and full force. And obviously, I won the battle. They kept driving forward down the road, and I kept going forward, still with the basketball in my arm. I was walking forward, and another high school teenager came by. This time, he was with his scooter. You know the scooter? He would approach me, he would pedal forward, and he comes up to me, seemingly unconnected. He comes up, he comes up to me, and he shouts right into my face. What the F are you doing? You think you're so cool? He holds onto my shirt, and he pushes me against the fence, literally that white fence. My head is pressed against the fence, and I couldn't move. I was frozen. I didn't know how to say the word help. Return was the motorbike with the two high school teenagers. They got off their motorbike. Three against one. And that was a day that I will never forget for the rest of my life. Bullying and violence are themes or narratives that just kind of happen in movies or maybe dramas or TV shows. Why would it happen to me? And why me? Did you ever think it was weird that when I went to Australia, it was my aunt and not my mother or father who sent me to Australia? Well, let me tell you something interesting. There are approximately three reasons why children wake up in the middle of the night. First, from a thunderstorm. Maybe it's a little too loud and you wake up as natural. And maybe you wake up from a nightmare, you're a little scared. Or thirdly, perhaps, your parents are arguing or fighting. When I was six in kindergarten, I woke up from all three. And at that time, both of my parents had full-time daytime jobs, and they went home very late. So what usually happened was, I would go home, next to my home, for dinner, which was my landlord, and she would cook me dinner, and she would tell me stories. And in a snap of a second, just like that, she would tell me a story that, Harrison, your family broke down. Your mother divorced. No, of course, she would not tell me like that. She would tell me, your mother went on a business trip. And this business trip turned out to be five years. And so I went home, and, and I turned out the plan that I knew was I would live with my dad for the rest of primary school. And after primary school, I would finally join my mother in Australia for the rest of my life, where she has full custody of my life. At least that was the plan. So after primary five, I went to Australia, and it turned out that I 
didn't follow the plan. I lived in a different city. She lived in Sydney, in the eastern part of Australia, and I lived in Adelaide, the southern part of Australia. We never really kept in touch or really lived with each other because she just wasn't quite ready or prepared to handle a child like me. She just wasn't settled down yet. And so I lived with a family that was not my family, but the colleagues of my aunt. They tried their best to make me feel at home and safe at bay, but all along, after these four years, I knew I was different. They would have their dinner gatherings, they also have children, but I knew I wasn't really part of them. I was the outsider. And after all four years studying in Australia, now I would go to Shanghai for high school. Because my mother's hometown is from Shanghai, and she wanted to go back because she was done with the new life in the foreign country. So she returned, and then obviously, I would follow her. And I did. I went back to Shanghai, and it turned out, just as you would expect, I could finally reunite with my mother after 10 years of disintegration. It turned out I lived entirely in the school dormitory. I never really lived with her, and we never really got along very well anyway. And after high school and three years into university now, never has a single day of my life been living with family. I've all along lived with school accommodation. Sometimes my friends ask me, hey Harrison, don't you ever feel like you miss family or you feel a little homesick? Let me answer it this way. Do you know the difference between a house and a home? A house is physical and a home is emotional. Like many of you, I can always go to a house. But unlike many of you, I can never go to a home. It just didn't work out that way. And life wasn't that easy. Family in my mind was just a concept. You see, sometimes life is full of BS, sour, bitter moments, like lemons. And usually things get better. But again, usually it's just a general statement. Perhaps there is another reason why children wake up in the middle of the night, and even adults, and perhaps 250 million people around the world. It is because of atopic dermatitis, eczema, or a very itchy, scaly, unappealing, self-destructive skin disease. According to doctors, there is no apparent solution that exists today, but it has been a demon that has lived inside of my life since six years old. It is not easy to live with this condition. Imagine you are going to the beach, or the last time you went to the beach, and you would go next to the seashores, there are some waves, and there's some sand, and use your hands or use the shuffle to dig out some holes, and the water naturally seeps up. Imagine you now you do this every single day. You go to the beach surface and you dig out holes, but except our skin is like the sand, but rougher than the sand. The water doesn't seep up, blood does. And naturally, just as you would assume, the tides to, in an overnight situation to fill up the holes, our skin never really fills up, and we never truly sleep. We are always itching in the middle of the night, involuntarily. Eczema sufferers are in constant pain. We just don't know how to get out of it. What would you do if all of this combined happened by the time you're 16 years old? I wasn't prepared to accept my fate this way. I didn't want that to be the rest of my life. And frankly, I don't believe in fate. I believe that if you are determined, obsessed, and perhaps ambitious, you can change the direction of your life. Sometimes there are sour, lemonous, or bitter moments, just like lemons. But if you squeeze them hard enough, a fine glass of lemonade will surface and appear. In 2013, I celebrated my 10th year anniversary with eczema. And by that time, I've tried all mainstream medications. I've tried Western medicine, I've tried Chinese medicine, and nothing seemed to work. I've even tried a diet, a diet where I would eat nothing but fruits for three days. 
I've also tried eating nothing and only drinking water for 10 days. Across all these different dietary experiments and suggestions based on nutrition, and because of this persistence, persistence, I begin to notice patterns. And in one of the many experiments, I finally discovered a solution that would change the course of my entire life. It wasn't so easy after all. Family, friends, all thought it was really impossible to fix. And even according to doctors, even today, there is no solution that is medically proven or exists yet. But I believe that while not all things have to be medically proven, not all things have to be. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the lemon in your life? What are the lessons in your life? You see, sometimes people like to give advice based on YouTube videos or just theory. But today, I would like to share with you some of the lemons I have navigated from my life and turned into lemonade based on experience. Having been left a scar that would never leave my memory in fifth grade, I learned that the biggest strength is not your physical strength. And it doesn't come from the outside. It comes from the inside. And although my conditions or environment might not be ideal, my family might not be the best family I can get, we can all learn to appreciate the hardships and learn to be grateful for what we have. And despite having been told no for an unfathomable amount of times that solutions to eczema do not exist, if you persist hard enough, you will find a solution. And I did. You might ask, what is your spirit? What is the spirit that I'm trying to instill all of you with tonight? Perhaps it's this. The greatest tragedy in life is not death, but life without purpose. Even after having recovered from eczema, even today, I continue to try to help the remaining 250 million people around the world solve this disease. It's because I've experienced both sides. I have transitioned from one end to the other. I've picked them up from rock bottom, and I know the greatest joy is when you relieve them into light, into life again. Turning the sourest, bittermost lemons and turning them into lemonade. In 2013, I decided to create a website so I could share more information around the world about eczema. And of course, in the beginning, the only subscribers were my family and I. By the beginning of 2014, I have already reached a thousand people around the world. But disappointed by the lack of clarity and the amount of confusing information online, in September 2017, I decided to publish the first book in my life dedicated to helping laymen remove the disease and understand this complicated disease entitled literally the eczema manual, the missing compendium in diagnosing, treating, and reversing eczema. By 2018, there are 250 million people around the world with eczema. And my work has been read across 210 countries by 800,000 people around the world, and I will continue doing so from now on and beyond. You might ask, what if I don't have a mission? Ask not what the world can do for you. Ask what you can do for the world. The world has many issues. The lemons don't have to be yours. Look around you. The United Nations exists for a reason. We are in the century where global collaboration has been the most accessible in the entire course of human civilization. Find your lemons. Create your lemonade. Thank you. <laughs>